something made him stop at the door and turn around. And as he looked back at the former president, he got the classic thumbs up. He's still fighting. He is gravely ill. He is with his daughters, Tricia Nixon Cox and Julie Nixon Eisenhower, and has been almost without interruption since Monday. At this historic moment, before we hear from our distinguished guest, I would like you to help the president fight and help his family and us honor him by rising and paying tribute by putting your hands together to this peerless statesman, Richard Nixon. It is no secret at all in political circles that there is no one in American political life today who, for whom President Nixon has more respect as a person and as a leader than the governor of our great state, Pete Wilson. We have with us today the governor's partner, whose interests and activities in public life both mirror his and supplement them in so many areas as a volunteer, as a specialist in scientific and medical issues, she is on the cutting edge of the social problems and the social opportunities that we face in this country. She is in very many ways, in the way she serves as a partner for her husband and as an ambassador for him and as a pair of separate eyes and ears for him and an indispensable advisor, very truly a Pat Nixon for the 90s. It is my privilege so that she can introduce our guest of honor to give you the First Lady of California, Gail Wilson. Mrs. Wilson. What a privilege it is to have been asked to introduce someone that I not only admire, but that I consider a friend. When I moved to Washington to marry Pete Wilson, I was a new Senate wife in May of 1983. Barbara Bush became my mentor and my role model, always willing to share her exper experience and her wisdom. I have found her to be a woman of great strength, a woman of charm, a woman of grace, a woman of compassion, and great wit. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome one of the most beloved First Ladies of the United States, Barbara Bush. I certainly want to thank my great friend, Gail, Gail Wilson. That is not the first time Gail has had to introduce me. And uh, we are good friends, and I'm honored to be her friend. And I want to thank John Taylor, and I want to thank each of you for that very warm welcome. You know, for me, this is a great day to be at the Nixon Library. I really feel good about it, and I thought about it, though, in, I was in Portland, and they said, well, you're certainly not going to go now, and I said, well, I certainly am. I think it's especially important today that we all gather at the Nixon Library to celebrate uh, Pat and Dick Nixon, and this particular time he's in our thoughts, and what better place to be, and he's in our prayers. He's been a good friend to the Bushes over the years, and we have enormous respect for him. And I'm honored to be here also uh, because of that gentle, strong, courageous woman filled with love, Pat Nixon, who we'll talk about a little later in just a few minutes. And of course, Gail, who is one of our country's most gracious first ladies. And although I know this is nonpartisan, I can't resist telling you that I think her husband is pretty darn good, too. In fact, Gail was with George in Houston last night uh, with, with uh, Pete, and I'm sure they were talking about politics. 
The first thing I'd like to do this afternoon is to bring you up to date on what George and I've been up to lately. You all do remember George, don't you? <laughs> it's been more than a year since we left the White House, and I'm very happy to report that we've settled very comfortably back into private life. Certainly it's nothing fancy. I drive a Mercury and George broils a mean steak. As you can see, we're still eating politically incorrectly. <laughs> But after 30 years of a public life, it's fun to be out of the news. In fact, just this February, when George played in the celebrity golf tournament right here in California, Bryant Gumbel hit a seagull. And George, and made the news, you all heard about that, George hit four spectators and nobody said a word. <laughs> <laughs> now we've built and moved into our new house, which truly is a dream. I'm sure you all remember the Los Angeles Times writing the article about the fact we couldn't possibly fit a house on it. Well, we're there, and it's a dream house, and it's our last house. It's our 31st. <laughs> this immediately tells you three things about us. One, George Bush is never boring. And two, we have more broken furniture and chipped china than anyone else in America. And obviously, he can't keep a job. <laughs> Never one to sit still, I sometimes think George is trying to keep the promise that he made to me when we got married 49 years ago. Stick with me, Barbara, he said, and I'll show you the world. Well, since leaving the White House, we have traveled abroad a number of times, including visits to Kuwait, cruises in the Caribbean and the Mediterranean, two trips to London, one to China, lunch with the King of Morocco, and we just got back Monday from a six-day swing to Singapore and Korea. Now, the only good thing about no longer being a government traveler is that I get to keep my frequent flyer miles. <laughs> Now, in London, we were privileged to have lunch with the Queen, and she was kind enough to make George a knight. The actual title of the award is the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of Bath. Does this make me the Lady of the Shower? <laughs> On our first day back home, George asked, how does it feel to be married to a real knight? And I think he was a little bit disappointed when I said to him, Okay, Sir George, how about helping with the dishes? <laughs> and by the way, George has turned out to be the best little dishwasher in Texas. <laughs> and in all seriousness, it is a very prestigious award, and I'm proud of George. He was only the eighth American to ever receive this award. It was given to six World War two generals and President Reagan. He also has received medals the past year from the Emir of Kuwait, Chancellor Cole of Germany. And all of these will be on display in the George Bush Presidential Library uh, when it's finished, center I should say, when it's finished in 1997 on the beautiful campus of Texas A&M in College Station, Texas. In between the traveling, George and I have both been working on books. He's working on one with Brent Scowcroft, who headed his National Security Council, and it's a very serious sort of reflective discussion of foreign policy, such as what happened in the Oval Office the night Desert Storm began. Mine, I'm afraid, will be more along the lines of what happened under the table. George, you know what, on the Prime Minister of Japan. <laughs> Now, I really did miss Millie on the project of writing my book. It's much more fun to write a book when you know that if you bombs, you can blame it on the dog. And speaking of Millie, she's put quite a bit of pressure on George and me, since her book was a bestseller, earning more than a million dollars. Now, she gave all of her royalties to fight illiteracy, which, of course, 
as George points out, she suffers from herself. <laughs> George says it's just plain not fair. He worked hard all his life and even reached the highest pinnacle in the political world, maybe the world. He became president and his dog still made more money than he did. <laughs> Now, in about a month, we'll be heading to our home in Maine for the summer, which will be great fun. However, I've already toured, told George it is not going to be like last summer. Would you believe that we entertained 172 overnight house guests, some of them more than once? That's at least 344 sheets, and who knows how many towels. Now, please don't feel badly that you weren't there. George just didn't see you. <laughs> Since leaving office, we have a beautiful, brand new grandson, our 13th, and two of our sons are running for governor in their home states. George, here for my boys. George W. in Texas and Jeb in Florida. And not that I'm doing any campaigning, but I feel that you'd want to know that they are the best qualified, the most handsome. <laughs> the finest, most decent young men you've ever met. And George and I are bursting with pride that they have chosen to serve their country in this way. I wasn't sure what to think, however, when I went to hear George W. speak, and he said that people told him that he had inherited his father's eyes and his mother's mouth. <laughs> I'm still wondering what that meant. <laughs> anyway, the transition for us from public to private life has not always been an easy one. And I'm ashamed to admit to you that sometimes when I'm out shopping and someone sidles up to me and I'm in a hurry and they say, aren't, aren't you Barbara Bush? And I have two good answers. Sometimes I say, no, I'm much younger than she is. <laughs> Or if I'm feeling a little bit better, I might say, no, but people tell me I look like her a lot. <laughs> but then this, I feel a little badly when I hear the companion say, see, I told you it wasn't her. <laughs> now, George Bush is much nicer than I am, and he would never do that. Many people ask us if we miss the White House, and the answer is, of course, First and most important, George had to be beaten. He wanted to finish the job he started. And I will confess that there are times when I'm very grateful the huge responsibility is no longer his. But I'm also just as glad that he was president during an important time in our history. The tougher the problems became, the more decisive and calm and sure George was. And Believe it or not, we loved living there. You always hear and read about the White House being a tough place to call home. I honestly think that's a bad rap. But that's not to say that some of the criticisms aren't true. It can be life in a fishbowl. For example, I went swimming every day, rain, snow, or shine, in an outdoor pool installed by friends of Jerry Ford. I can't tell you how many times I was caught with wet hair no makeup, and a sweatsuit running from the pool to the residence. In all honesty, it was not a pretty sight. <laughs> and then, of course, there was the press wanting to know every minute detail of our lives. That took a bit of getting used to. You know, it's the funniest thing. One day you can say anything you like, and nobody listens. And the moment your husband becomes the president-elect, your every thought, word, everything you do is noteworthy, it's studied, it's analyzed, and it's in print. <laughs> Controversy really makes the news, and a very good example of this, for 12 years, or 8 years really, I gave graduation speeches, and each year I wrote the same speech, 
and I gave it six or seven times with small local variations. The year of the Wellesley speech, I gave that same talk to St. Louis University, the University of Pennsylvania, and several others. None of you knew it, did you? <laughs> but when I got to Wellesley, because of the controversy surrounding my being chosen as the graduation speech, that speech was covered live on television nationally and is still quoted regularly. And you know, that controversy generated a lot of mail. My brother wrote, he was ready to come right down and stand at my side, and George Bush was ready to kill a number of people, and several surprising um, women correspondents stood up for me, and, and the nicest message I got was a handwritten letter from Dick Nixon telling me that he was absolutely outraged, furious, and I should go there and give him hell. <laughs> Gail and I were talking about this earlier a little bit. He was so thoughtful about writing notes, encouraging you or uh, giving hints, and it was a very helpful thing, and, and I really appreciate it, and I know George did too. Now, even Martha Washington, who didn't really live in the White House, complained about the restraints of the job. She once wrote a friend, indeed, I'm more like a state prisoner than anything else. There are certain bounds set for me which I must not depart from, and I cannot do as I like. But having said all of this, the pluses way outweighed the minuses of living in the White House, as far as I was concerned. George and I have always lived in happy homes, but nothing matching that special place. The staff surrounded us with goodwill, warmth, caring. They gave the President of the United States exactly what he needed a happy, tranquil home. Many of the staff had been there for years, and I was very impressed that they did not gossip about the previous tenants, the Johnsons, the Nixons, the Fords, the Carters, or the Reagans. You know, that's especially comforting to know that when you leave, they're not going to talk about you. To really talk about our life in the White House, I'd like to start at the beginning, not in 1989, but in 1967. That was the year George was a freshman congressman from Texas, and we packed up our family and moved from Houston to Washington. Every weekend, I would drag our children around Washington to see the sights. Eventually, the boys begged off, and poor little Dora was too young, and I'll never forget the day when she and I stood with our noses pressed against the White House fence taking a tour. And at that moment, the White House door opened on the south grounds, and we strained to see who lived there and looked there, what it looked like. Well, fortunately, I didn't have to wait too long to get a peek inside, because the Johnsons, who were occupants at the time, were very kind to their fellow Texans, even if we didn't always share the same political views. They invited us to a number of receptions and dinners, but my favorite was a luncheon where I quickly discovered that most of the attendees were world-renowned doctors and nurses, and all of them women. Several people asked me what I did, and I began to wonder myself. <laughs> you can imagine my surprise when Mrs. Johnson got up and said there were about 20 nurses among the congressional wives, including Mrs. George Bush from Texas. <laughs> Not, as the children say. Whoops, I was at a lunch under false pretenses, but I loved it. <laughs> and, and I should tell you that this took place a few days after President Johnson shocked the nation by telling us he would not run for re-election. And I marveled that day at Lady Burr's composure. She acted as if absolutely Nothing was on her mind but us. She's quite a lady. The Johnsons, of course, were followed by the Nixons, and one again, once again, the President and First Lady were very kind to the Bushes of Texas. Pat Nixon truly was sensational, and I'm not sure she always gets the credit for everything she accomplished. She worked tirelessly promoting volunteerism, and also is one of the people responsible for making the White House the beautiful home that it is today. She personally was involved in acquiring some of the White House's 
most treasured historic possessions, including some original furniture. It was her idea to light the White House at night, and she inaugurated the spring and fall tours, which draw thousands of people every year. But what I remember most about Pat was her personal touch. She had a way about her that made people feel comfortable, welcome, and very important. I'll never forget when uh, a group of Republican congressional wives went to the White House to present her with a 50-state Republican elephant quilt. It had all the wives' names embroidered on it. Uh, I had not been there long enough to work on this project, so I can tell you in all honesty, this quilt was not a thing of great beauty. <laughs> and I was not surprised not to see it in this building. But <laughs> the wives thought she would put it in the Lincoln bedroom. It would remain there forever. No way was that going to be allowed. But Pat, of course, raved over it. She spent a lot of time talking to each and every one of us. And I was amazed I had to excuse myself early. Actually, someone had whispered in my ear, if you'll start the crowd going, it's time to get them moving on. But I went up and apologized and said that I had to leave and get a carpool, pick up my children, and go to the grocery store or something. And she told me that when she was the wife of the vice president, she drove her own car, she took Julie and Trisha to school. She bought her clothes off the sales rack at Lord and Taylor's. And then at night, a big black limousine would come by and pick her up and take her to a state dinner after she'd picked up the babysitter and several other things. And I later thought when I had that, was married to the vice president, my how times changed. But Pat was so very gracious to us all, and she acted like she had all the time in the world. And I certainly now know that she didn't. And I doubt many handled similar situations with such grace and ease. I was touched by our little conversation, so touched, in fact, that I absolutely lost my head. I picked up the carpool, and then I went racing to the grocery store. I sideswiped a car on the way in, I couldn't find the person. It was the most beaten up car you'd ever seen, so I left a note on the side. And later, George Bush paid for every dent in that car for the last 10 years. <laughs> I was so unglued over this, and I had the groceries in the car because I was leaving with George on a trip, that I got out of the car and left them in the trunk for two days. <laughs> I managed to forget about um, the groceries in the trunk, where they were found several days later, fermenting nicely. That was the effect Pat Nixon had on me. I admired her so much. And this also reminds me of the day that this beautiful library was opened. And um, I've got a feeling Pat knows that somebody here has the most wonderful green thumb. And it was beautiful that day, but today it is absolutely the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And that was a very happy day. And uh, I note that uh, Pat is looking down on us all. And then during the Reagan administration, George and I were, of course, included in a great many events. And so we move on to January 20th, 1989. When that happened, we at least knew our way around. And thanks to Nancy Reagan, I barely needed to touch a thing. You know, she was greatly criticized for fixing up the White House, but in proof it needed sprucing up including new pop plumbing and new electricity. Everything was just right when we moved in, and I, for one, think it was fabulous that she did that. From the beginning, we knew that living in the White House would be a whole new experience, not just for George and me, but the entire family. And during that first weekend, when all the children and grandchildren were gathered for the inauguration, we sat down for dinner for the first time together. And we suddenly noticed that George W. and Laura's twins, who were seven years old, were not there. And I asked where in the world they were. And one of the White House butlers, in a very serious tone, told us that the girls had ordered sandwiches to be served in the bowling alley. <laughs> we didn't even know we had a bowling alley. And it certainly had not taken them very long to learn the perks, of, some of the perks of their Dampy being the president. But their dreams of life 
grand lifestyle quickly ended when they were ordered upstairs to eat dinner with the family and informed there would be no special orders. And by the way, we learned later that, that, that President Nixon was the one who had the bowling alley installed and it was a great addition to the White House. Certainly the grandchildren provided many of the lighter moments in the White House, but not always. We all managed to take our turn in making sure there'd be good stories to tell for years to come. However, living there was often a very sobering and humble experience. I will never forget the stillness of the house the day Desert Storm began. Or for that matter, George's anguish whenever he had to send our young men and women into battle. At these times, more than any other, it was impossible not to feel the presence of our predecessors, of Abraham and Mary Lincoln, who suffered so much in that house, of Harry Truman, who wrote of the great loneliness he felt, and of Abigail Adams, who worried about the enormous responsibilities her husband faced. All of our experiences have been very, very different, yet historically intertwined. However, let me say right here and now that we did not see or believe in the Lincoln ghost. Winston Churchill is said to have run into him during a midnight stroll, and the Reagan's dog reportedly refused to go into the Lincoln bedroom. Millie, I'm happy to tell you, had no such problem. And the only specter I ever saw there was a rat in the swimming pool, which unfortunately turned out to be the real thing. What did bring memories of the house alive, however, were the reminiscence of the former tenants. The Eisenhower grandchildren told us how they used to ride their bikes down on the first floor. And David Eisenhower talked about how much he loved to watch his grandfather paint. And Eddie Cox remembered studying for his bar exam in the upstairs solarium. And Linda Bird Robb shared stories of trying to date a young Marine named Chuck Robb. Certainly living in the White House is a great privilege, and with privilege comes responsibility. I tried hard to follow the advice of Lady Bird Johnson, who said that the First Lady has the best bully pulpit in the world. She was absolutely right, and I tried to use mine to promote literacy, a cause I've been involved with for nearly 15 years. I truly believe, and so do the experts, that if more people could read, write, and comprehend, we could find the answers to so many of the other problems facing our society today. I'm very proud of the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy, which to date has awarded 52 grants for a total of $2 million and is still going very strong. You know, there's a lot of talk today, or certainly in the last few years, about how the role of the First Lady is changing. And I've read that I'm the last of an era. Well, if that era includes the likes of Pat Nixon, Rosalind Carter, and others, I'm certainly proud to be counted among them. However, I really don't want to get into the discussion about the evolving role of the President's spouse. The position of First Lady is, after all, an imaginary one. It's not defined in the Constitution. It comes with no job description and no salary. It's really up to each individual to make of the job what they want. I don't know about you. I can't wait to see what the first gentleman makes of it. <laughs> All I know is that I'm very grateful that I had such a wonderful opportunity. I witnessed history from a very special perspective, and I met some of the influential people, most influential people of our time, and the best of the best in America, the best teachers, artists, writers, entertainers, students, and just plain people. I suspect most of us who have shared the experience would agree with Lady Bird Johnson, who quoted this line of poetry in her diary the last night in the White House. I seek to celebrate my glad release, the tents of silence in the camp of peace. But then she added about her life as First Lady, I have loved almost every day. 
I think I'd say I have love every day. Now I'd be very happy to answer a few questions after I tell you that I have been, I think, doubly blessed by knowing Pat Dick Nixon, and I join all of you in uh, celebrating their enormous contribution to our country and certainly to those of us who are lucky enough to know them. And I really feel that I have been blessed to be invite, invited to speak here today on sort of, I feel, very precious ground. So thank you very much and appreciate it. Bush, you cannot be the last of an era of your kind of first lady because we have to get Gail Wilson there first. As the first lady indicated, she's been gracious enough to uh, stay a little longer and take your questions. We have uh, uh, young people in the audience with handheld microphones. If you will raise your hand, we will get one of those youngsters with you, or I hope uh, sometimes not two youngsters, and they will uh, 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 give you a microphone. Don't be shy. You. Mrs. Bush, what was the most memorable moment of all in the White House for you and your family? There were so many memorable moments. I might tell you, uh, uh, there just were a lot, but the day George gave the Medal of Freedom to Locke Valenza was pretty exciting. He had come from Poland, uh, the country solidarity had just taken over, and he's a little fella, and he sort of stood while George read the citation, and the tears ran down his face. And suddenly he looked to me as we looked up at him as every man who ever lived behind the Iron Curtain and he stood for freedom, and it was pretty, a pretty moving moment. But uh, that day was climaxed, I might tell you, by a rather interesting happening, because the, the audience was enormous that evening when George gave him the medal, and it was filled with a great many enormous men who were, and women who were labor union leaders, because they had supported Locke Valenza throughout the years, and it was appropriate they be there. And uh, we went out in the hall and stood with him and shook hands with all these people who were so moved by his being there and accepting this medal. And while we were doing that, the dining room table in the White House was particularly laden with candelabras and enormous amounts of food because it was late in the, late in the afternoon. And uh, one of the gentlemen, stepped back, sat, sort of leaned on the table to talk, and broke the antique table in the middle. And the White House staff is so good that they raced around and picked up candelabras and flowers and food. And by the time we got in the room, it looked OK. It was propped up, but we didn't even notice it because the crowd was so big. The gentleman in question left immediately, <laughs> never to be seen again, and the table left for four months. Please, ladies and gentlemen, question? It's one back there. One here, too. Let's get to there first. We bet Phil Donaghy's not I just curious. wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed your speech, and I wondered if you would mind sharing with us what George is doing today. All right. That dirty dog, I'd be glad to tell you. <laughs> he stayed over in Houston last night with Laud Cook, who's from California, stayed at our little tiny new house, and because he wanted to be with Pete and Gail. And they left at the crack of dawn to go to Bermuda to play golf with two of our sons, one son-in-law, 
and let's see, that makes uh, three, four, five, and three other gentlemen. They're going to play golf all weekend. <laughs> and I'm glad for him. He needs it. I'm curious, when the election was lost and you realized your time in the White House was limited, what did you do to make the most of it? That's a good question. Uh, we did exactly what we've been doing every single day for three years. I mean, our children all came for Christmas, which was wonderful. We were not... Um, George will tell you that I left the White House, started leaving in my mind the day we lost the election. And it was easier for me. I didn't have a full-time job, for starters. But we were very, very busy. Uh, we did all the things we'd done before. We just enjoyed them more, maybe. Yes, ma'am. As a young girl, did I ever think I was going to be married to the president? Absolutely not. I know my mother and father are up there still saying, I can't believe this happened. <laughs> I know they are. I mean, nobody's more surprised than me. My dad might have been semi-surprised. My mother's in total shock. <laughs> but no, I didn't. And I didn't think when I married that glorious 20-year-old that he was going to be president either. But, you know, I really have thought about George a lot and go to colleges and schools and speak some. And... Uh, I think George is a little bit like Sandra Day O'Connor. He never thought he'd be president. She never thought she'd be a Supreme Court justice. She just did everything the best she could every single day as it came along. And I believe in that theory. You sort of build blocks. And, and I think that's what happened to George Bush. He just did everything the best he could. Nothing wrong with that. Barbara, I really enjoyed listening to you today. And you mentioned that you were going to have a book out pretty soon and I was just wondering if it's going to be out very shortly and if you've titled it yet with your sense of humor. Well, <laughs> actually I titled it but the book people, Scribner's, uh, having given me a very healthy advance, uh, <laughs> changed the title to something very imaginative like uh, a memoir, Barbara Bush, a memoir. <laughs> I, my title for it was, Will the Woman in the Red Dress Please Get Out of the Picture? <laughs> now, Gail will understand that. If you're the wife of, or probably the husband of, the candidate, people are always sort of sidling the spouse out and I, when we first got into politics and I was shy and young and trim, why, I kept hearing someone yell that. And I looked down and, my gosh, I was in the red dress. <laughs> That's what I was going to call it, but... Donna? Mrs. Bush, I don't have a question for you, but I do have a thank you. In 1992, I was invited by you to meet with you at the White House. And I must share with you that it was one of the most memorable moments in my life. Oh. And I do thank you very much. I can't see you, but thank you very much. <laughs> yes, ma'am. In order to make a better world, what message would I like to give to the youth of the day? I really would give it to their parents. And I'd say... Uh, Talk to your children, listen to your children, read to your children, hug your children. You don't have to be there all the time, but you have to be there all the time. A lot of children today really are neglected. Not, and they're abused. They're not physically abused, but they're abused because their parents don't hear them, don't listen to them. I'd say don't worry that, they, that your children don't listen to you, but remember they're watching you all the time. I didn't make that up, I stole that, I have to confess, but uh, uh, I would say that to you, and I'd uh, say turn off that TV every now and then.
This is Bud. Yes. Could you share with us the uh, experience of repairing your home in uh, Kenny Bunport when it was hit by the storm? Well, that's a good question. And, you know, at that time, sad to say, Maine was in a uh, big recession. There were a lot of people willing to help. And then, in all honesty, George, in Kenny Bunkport, Maine, was a very popular man. He'd grown up there. And everybody killed themselves to do the most marvelous job. And the house is prettier today than it ever was before. And it was done in six months. I can't hear you. How is Millie doing? I hope someone would ask me that. Millie is fine. And last night in Portland, someone asked me, is Millie going to have any more puppies? And uh, Millie has lupus. She's in remission, and she has been for two and a half years. And yesterday morning at 5 a.m., she leapt up on the bed and awakened me. But that reminded me, you know, as the wife of the president, you get a ton of mail. Millie got a ton of mail. And after Millie had her babies, we got some hate letters from people because they felt that there was an overpopulation of animals. And I had many suggestions that Millie should have adopted. <laughs> Millie, because of lupus, can have no more children. Go ahead, Ed. Mrs. Bush? One minute, then I'll come to Mrs. Bush. Every president's left a legacy at the White House. left a horseshoe pit, but I hope he left much more than that. I hope he left a legacy of warmth and kindness and decency and honor. That's what I hope he left. <laughs> what I know he left. Bush? Yes. Was there ever a, a time where you did not want to be the person because it was just so difficult for you. What was the most difficult thing you had to do as the First Lady of White House? What was the most difficult thing? Was there ever a time I didn't want to be First Lady? No, there was never that time because I adore George Bush and if he's president, by darn, I'm going to be there. But uh, it wasn't that difficult. It's the most extraordinary house. It's really... I didn't feel as it was a prison. I felt that it was a house filled with love and warmth. And George and I missed the people in the house very, very much. They were wonderful, kind, generous, professional people. The job itself, of course, is a terrible job. I can remember George praying night after night for the children in Iraq. And the terrible burdens presidents have uh, and, I mean, you go and you meet the families of young men and women who have been killed either in war or on accidents on ships or... Those are not easy times, but those are your job. And I, I never want to change my job. But I will tell you in all honesty, I'm glad George Bush is home and I love having him there without all that enormous responsibility. Fighting a Congress that's opposed to your president and a press that's opposed to your president and then several independents who are flailing away out there just ain't all easy. Mrs. Bush? Um, I admire you so much. You're one of my uh, most, really one of my mentors. And um, my question is regarding, um, in your opinion, how do you think is the best way to handle criticism when you hear it? Like, just related to your own when, when I'm criticized, well, first of all, I lie a lot and pretend it doesn't bother me. <laughs> and sometimes I pretend I haven't read it. And, uh, you know, you shouldn't react to criticism. You maybe should try to make yourself better. But you're going to be criticized in this business. And the thing to do is ignore it. Stick with the positive, the pluses, the good things that happen. And sometimes you should consider the source.
one more question, okay. and the lady of the microphone yeah. is the winner. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, real quick, Mrs. Bush, first of all, I admire you and your husband, but I also admire your energy. How do you keep going um, even after you're semi-retired? That's a good question, but it's because I'm very young. <laughs> I get up at five every morning. I have a small sinking spell around five in the afternoon, but not too long. I, I think I'm just blessed with with extraordinary good health. As you can see, I'm well fed, <laughs> but uh, I'm, 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 I think I'm probably pretty strong. So I think. Mrs. Bush has spoken eloquently of how she misses those who work in the White House. I think I speak for all of you here to say how much we miss having her and President Bush in the White House. And as she feels blessed, so do we, to have had the benefit of their calm leadership for four years. I would also like to thank our State First Lady, Gail Wilson, for being here and serving as she has today. As Mrs. Bush indicated, it was not assumed that we would have this event because of the unhappy events occurring in New York. But Mrs. Bush wanted to be here, and Mrs. Wilson wanted to be here, and we knew that you would want to be here to be with them and also to be on what Mrs. Bush has described very accurately as being very special ground. I would like to thank Nancy, Nancy Heflin, the musical voice of the Los Angeles Dodgers, and also Ann Patrick. And also Ann Patrick of Patrick's Musician in Fullerton for making it possible for us to have the instrument that Nancy played. You see ladies and a few gentlemen, uh, uh, the ladies at least are in the brilliant red coats. They are members of the Richard Nixon Library Docent Guild. They are volunteers without whom it would be impossible to operate this institution. Uh, they always have rooms in their ranks for more. And we urge you, uh, if you would like to consider joining the Docent Guild, that you inquire at the reception desk on the way out. Some of you, I know, have tickets to join Mrs. Bush and Mrs. Wilson uh, for lunch. We would ask those of you to proceed back into the library along the North Colonnade. And those of you who are catching the co coaches back to your cars, please go along the South Colonnade here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here, and please keep praying for the 37th president and his family. Former First Lady Barbara Bush made these remarks at the Nixon Presidential Library in Yorba Linda, California, prior to Mr. Nixon's death Friday night. Monday night, Lady Margaret Thatcher addresses a conservative political action group banquet. You'll see live coverage of the former British Prime Minister's remarks beginning at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 Pacific. House Republican Whip Newt Gingrich is also scheduled to speak at the event. A speech by Lady Margaret Thatcher Monday night on C-SPAN. <laughs>